You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Pond University is your one-stop shop for all things pond management. It is hosted by Mitchell Ziski and Megan Gunn from Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Join us as we talk with biologists, managers and pond owners about the topics and tools needed to manage your pond for good habitat and great fishing. So grab a notebook and a beverage and sit back and enjoy Pond University. G'day and welcome back to Pond University. Um, it's great to be back. Where this is our fourth episode. Um, things are chugging along really well. Hi Megan, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Mitch? I'm good. Um, what have uh, What have you been up to? We're really getting into to real life winter at the moment. We haven't had any snow yet, but at least it's a little cooler. It's so cold outside. I've been staying inside. There's a a TV channel that looks like a fireplace, so I've been looking at that and listening <laughs> to the crackling sounds. Um, but other than that, just trying to wrap up the semester. I'm ready for it to be over, as I'm sure the students were glad to be done last week, but a few more days. Yeah, that's right. We are, we're we're very close now. It's uh, We're getting close to the holiday season, and everybody gets to take a break and take a breath and and you know hopefully they survive the the semester and yeah. we can regroup and and hopefully 2021 it'll treat us a little nicer than 2020 did a whole lot nicer would be perfect <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've got some exciting news we uh so the, you know this is the fourth episode we're recording now but i think we've had two episodes um uploaded by now and i think the natural resources university network has had i think nine or ten episodes uploaded mm -hmm. And um, I just found out yesterday that we've reached over a thousand downloads already for that's exciting. For the network. Yeah, it's and we've had uh, people from other countries are listening in as well. We've had some Aussies listening in as well. And I think we've had <laughs> had some uh, people through Asia and and the Middle East interested uh, listening. So that's so cool. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. It shows that even though you know a lot of the topics we discuss are sort of Midwest focused, they're really applicable to all over all over the world. So that's so awesome. Um, it's really great to see the the reach that we're having and the impact that we're having. So really, we hope this is just the tip of the iceberg. I agree. So if you are listening, you know, encourage your friends to subscribe and listen and, and hopefully they'll learn some some great stuff. Mm -hmm. So we've got it. So um, so in today's episode, we're actually going to um, talk to somebody from the Natural Resources Conservation Service about pond construction and pond maintenance. And what's exciting about this episode is, you know, we had known that we wanted to record an episode on this topic, um, but we sort of moved it up in our schedule based on some feedback that we got from one of our listeners. So one of our listeners reached out after listening to the first episode. Yay! <laughs> they emailed us and, and uh, discussed a few issues they're having with their with their pond leaking. Uh, and so I thought, hey, why not? Why not uh, get somebody on to, to tell us about that? And so um, I think that's a great, you know, I'm really excited because, um, and that's what we want. We want listeners to reach out to us to give us ideas on topics and if you have questions and, and we hope to be able to get guests that can come in and um, and answer some of your questions. Yeah, that was super exciting. Like the, the episode had just dropped and then the next day there was already questions in the inbox. That's so cool. I know. It was really cool. And, um, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe we have a weird definition of cool but uh, <laughs> um, most people don't want to get more emails most people want to get less emails but it was it was actually great to see not only that we had people listening because otherwise it's just us sitting in a, two rooms here talking to ourselves yeah. um, <laughs> but it was great that they that they could find us reach out to us and generally had some some questions and uh, that we can potentially help them with so yeah essential pond terms the segment where we hope to expand your vocabulary by defining important terms for pond management. A couple of terms that you will hear in today's episode are watershed or drainage area and pool area. The watershed or drainage area of a pond is simply the area of land that will drain into a pond after it rains. The topography, soil type and land use in the watershed will have many implications for the pond. For example, if the topography causes water to flow away from your pond, your pond may struggle with low water levels. 
If there is intensive agriculture in the watershed, then your pond may have issues with excessive sediments and nutrients entering the pond. The pool area of a pond is the area that has the ability to retain water. One significant factor in determining the amount of water that will flow into a pond is the drainage area to pool area ratio. If you have a small drainage to pool ratio, then you may not have enough water in your pond. Conversely, if you have a large drainage to pool ratio, you may have good water levels, but you may struggle with excessive sediments or nutrients. Okay, so today we have Scott Wagner from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Hi, Scott. How are you? Doing good. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Great. Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking the time to, to come and uh, talk to us about pond construction and, and pond maintenance. Um, how's the, uh, the fall and the early winter been treating you? Uh, very well, actually. Uh, you know, actually at NRCS, we recently purchased a new uh, uh, boat, a remote control boat for pond uh, surveying. So it's, uh, it's been, uh, been fun. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fun. And uh, yeah, I guess, you know, given that 2020 has been a little strange for all of us, is that... Um, how how has it changed what you do with the with the NRCS? Uh, as, as you can tell, uh, we're not meeting in person, and I mm -hmm. actually haven't been in my office in uh, probably about uh, four months now. So uh, wow, it's uh, it's been nice living out of my home office. Uh -huh. the, the thing I've got to keep reminding myself is I, uh, I I don't live at work. I need to separate that. So even though I'm kind of living at work currently. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all struggling with that right now. Still. Uh, yes. Uh. Yeah, well, you know, you never you never know what you're going to find when you go back to your office. You might have a someone someone else living in there or something. Uh, <laughs> I know, and as my wife jokes, should we even have office space anymore? Sometimes, so uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so we'll see how what, what changes occur. So it's inter yeah. it's very interesting times. Yeah, um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at the NRCS? How long you've been there? Um, you know, just your general experience with with pond management. Sure. As you said, I'm Scott. I'm Scott Wagner. I'm an agricultural engineer, a uh, professional engineer, uh, certified. Uh, I've been with NRCS about 18 years. I've uh, been all across the state of Indiana, from Greencastle to Huntington to Lafayette to Lebanon. So, been a lot of areas across the state in Indiana. Uh, and, and for folks that are not familiar with NRCS, uh, we've got a rich history uh, supporting our America farmlands and ranchers and forest owners uh, with more than 80 years of uh, assistance to those folks. Uh, uh, our, our motto at NRCS is helping people help the land. So uh, that's what we're, we're here for. Uh, one thing that we do at NRCS is provide uh, financial and technical assistance uh, voluntarily to our uh, private landowners to help uh, the environment and their ag operations. So it's it's been a it's been a fun job within RCS the last 18 years. So for those that are not familiar with that acronym, what does NRCS stand for? Definitely. Uh, so the NRCS stands for the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So we are uh, housed under the USDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture. So uh, we are a federal federal uh, agency, and actually about every every county in Indiana, about every county, has a field office with an NRCS individual in that office to provide assistance to the landowners. So we've got a wealth of resources for, uh, for folks out there. And if, if you're looking to find your, um, your county contact for the NRCS or, or you know, your Purdue Extension County contact, you can visit our website and we have a find your county contact webpage and, and all of that information is listed up there. So. Definitely. And one more uh, plug for this local soil and water conservation district. Uh, usually we house, they're, they're housed in our offices uh, typically with NRCS. So those uh, local folks are very good to, to talk to also. The SWCDs is the acronym for that. So. And so the since you've been at the NRCS, have you just worked on, on pond construction, maintenance stuff, or have you done a whole range of different things? Uh, I wish I could say I just have done ponds. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, like most federal agencies, we're, uh, we've got budgetary constraints, so I have actually wear multiple hats. I'm uh, the, the, the state energy engineer. I'm the state environmental engineer. I'm the state CAD engineer. So of the many things that I do at NRCS, this is just a small uh, portion of it. So, But this is one that I feel is very, uh, very important for, our, for conservation. 
Absolutely. And, you know, the, the first few episodes of this podcast, we've really started to talk a lot about the connection, you know, the, the complexity of, of aquatic systems in, on private lands and the connection between the land and the water. And, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that a lot, of, a lot of that ties in with the work that you do as well. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so, so I guess to kick us off, um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, about ponds from from an engineering standpoint or from the physical characteristics standpoint? We've we've started to talk a lot about ecosystems, and and you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast are probably interested in plants and fish and and things like that. But can you tell us about some of the important physical characteristics of ponds that people need to know about and, and think about? Oh, definitely. With with all ponds, uh, first of all, to back back into my NRCS uh, uh, history, I guess, is we have a wealth of information uh, for pond construction and pond physical characteristics through our uh, field office tech guide. Uh, this field office tech guide is our primary scientific reference. Uh, within that tech guide, we have a section four that covers the conservation practice standards. So uh, ponds is what we're talking about today. So this code 378 kind of covers some of the minimum requirements of a successful pond. Uh, and these include uh, the top width of the dam, uh, 10 foot is typically the minimum size dam, uh, top width that we we're really interested in uh, trying to maintain at least. Uh, side slopes of the dam, uh, this is uh, uh, typically uh, uh, two to one is the, 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 the minimum, or should I say the maximum slope that's there. Uh, I really highlight that we really need to have safe uh, safety on these embankments. So having a, a flatter side slope, something that can be mowed a lot easier is something that's very important. Uh, within that pond, uh, there is a spillway of some sort, some sort of a, a water control structure, if you will. Uh, and this is uh, kind of maintains the water level within that pond. Uh, also important within that pond, in that embankment, is the cutoff trench, and this is something that's very important with, uh, within ponds, is to prevent the, a lot of seepage through the dam. Uh, we have some minimum requirements in that standard. Another one is the, the reservoir area. What's the minimum size? And at NRCS, we recommend having at least a quarter acre uh, f uh, pond size for an embankment uh, pond, or uh, 0.15 acres for an excavated pond. And then lastly, uh, the inlet and out controls of that, uh, of that water control structure is having some sort of anti-vortex pipe uh, inlet or some sort of scour protection at the outlet of that is some of the physical characteristics of a pond. Okay, great. And we'll make sure, you know, we'll link to the, that, um, that technical guide in, in our show yes. notes so that you can find those. Um, and I... Um, you know, one of the, the questions that I have is, you know, you mentioned a little bit the difference between a, um, an, an embankment pond or versus an ex excavated pond. Can you talk a little bit about those differences and, and when someone might, you know, consider one or the other or... Exactly. So really, that's a lot of based on location, location, location is where that's at. Uh, depending on what you have on your site... If you're capturing a, a stream or a goalie, uh, that's more than likely going to be an embankment pond. So you're uh, stopping that valley and then creating a pond from that valley that's the, that will form your pond. So that would be the embankment pond. Uh, the excavated pond is pretty much uh, as, as it is, is you just dig a hole and, uh, and the water is in that hole and what feeds that pond is just strictly what rains in it and what seeps in from the groundwater. So uh, in Indiana, typically see a lot of excavate or a lot of, uh, excuse me, a lot of embankment ponds, but we do see a lot of excavated ponds in areas where you cannot get an embankment like northern Indiana sometimes. Okay. And are there, um, are there pros and cons? Like I imagine that, um, you know, having an embankment pond or a gully or a stream, you know, that you're probably going to have a more reliable water source coming, you know, in water level, more stable water levels potentially in that pond. Um, you know, if you have an, uh, an excavated pond and, and you don't get much rain for a little while, there's, there's probably a greater chance that that pond can, the water levels can drop. Are there other pros and cons between, you know, I imagine, like you said, it really just depends what, what location own, uh, landowners have to, to use for a pond. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're, say you're, you're looking to buy some land and you're looking at for, for land with ponds on it and you see these different types of ponds, are there pros and cons between, between each of them? Oh, definitely. And I, I'm going to go back on what's the goals of that pond within the, within the landscape is uh, some of the goals that we look at is if it is for livestock, we really want to have clean water. So having that, that stream, if you don't have management activity control upstream of that pond, having clean water is essential for livestock. Uh, irrigation, you want a large amount of water for irrigation. So uh, it's a large volume. So having a stream fed 
pond is great from an irrigation standpoint. Uh, you can still achieve the irrigation from a large body of water, uh, like a strip pit of some sort. Uh, another one, uh, the goal is fish production. You really need to to have a, a pond that's less than two acres uh, to, to manage. I mean, uh, is easier to manage, I guess, uh, is the best way to put it. Uh, fire protection uh, is another goal of a pond. You really need a good, adequate source of, 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 of water for potentially a dry hydrant. Uh, so a fire department can pull out and provide fire protection. So a uh, suite of goals, I guess, is the the reason between the two different types. Uh, and really, a lot of the ponds that I've dealt with in my career have been the embankment type ponds. Uh, the one downside, I guess, uh, Mitch, is the, the you have no, sometimes you'll have little control over the watershed or the drainage area. And I don't know if many of your listeners understand what drainage area is or watershed is, is it's the water that sheds off the landscape or drains off the landscapes to that common point. So within an embankment pond, uh, is, is watershed is typically watershed fed. So uh, whereas a dugout or an excavated pond is typically, it is watershed based, but it's a lot on a lot smaller scale because you're you're kind of digging out what's there and uh, and some water washes in, but not nearly what you have in an embankment structure standpoint. So uh, some of the that that's some of the differences, I guess. If that covers any more questions, I'll dig into it. <laughs> no, I think that's great and. Um... You know, I think you know, understanding the watershed, I think, is important from a, um, you know, looking at the, the water quality and the ecology of, of ponds, understanding what your watershed is and what is happening on that watershed, I think is important. And I think you make a really good point about thinking of, about your goals for your pond, um, whether you're looking to buy a property with a pond or looking to build a pond. You know, the ponds can have lots of different goals and there are different options depending on those goals. Definitely. Um, so Scott, if somebody is thinking about building a new pond, what are some some things that they should be considering, and what are what are things that they should be thinking about? Uh, as I say, as I said a little bit ago, the watershed is very important for that pond. So uh, having a, a very good tool at NRCS that we have that's very helpful is our Web Soil Survey. And if you don't know of this site, you can easily Google it, uh, or, or <laughs> I should just say uh, you should search for it. Uh, <laughs> but the Web Soil Survey it has a suite of uh, uh, of, of useful information, it's soil based. So to have a very successful pond, you really need to have good soils, not only in the pond area, but also within that watershed. So one, one tool within the Web Soil Survey is uh, is the hydro hydrologic soil groupings. And I don't wanna go too far into the weeds on this, but this groupings is, uh, is kinda, it groups all of our soils and our landscape into the runoff potential that they have. And it does between an A and a D, which is funny because A is the best, which is the highest infiltration, which is unfortunately bad for ponds, but, and it goes all the way through D, which is a slower infiltration uh, soils. So if you look at your landscape and you, and you, and you see what's there in that drainage area and you, have really good infiltrating soils, that's typically not the best uh, location for a pond, unfortunately, because you want that runoff from your landscape to go into the ponds. And that same goes with the excavated pond too, is you don't want it, th those soils to be in high infiltration rates and then you have a dry pond. So uh, using that web soil survey as a great tool to look at uh, potentially if, if a pond will work on, on, on a property or the watershed will work for that pond. Uh, one thing that we do at, at we, NRCS, we kind of group these uh, folks that are looking at ponds into uh, pool area to drainage area. So uh, within the hydraulic, hydrologic soil groupings, uh, we have the, the C and the D realm is one, one place we look at. Uh, if the soils are in the C and the D, we really want to have one acre of pool to about four acres of drainage area. And that also goes to the high end of one acre of pool to 30 acres of drainage area. So we kind of have that range for the C and the D soils. And then we go down to the B and the C soils, and we need a little bit higher drainage area to pool area of about the low end of about one acre of pond to six acres of drainage area. So it's a, it's a good tool to, to look at from a soil standpoint to see if a pond will even uh, be manageable on your landscape uh, and, and being an engineer by trade, I know we can accomplish anything. So <laughs> but using this tool, uh, Web Soil Survey, to give you an idea of uh, if a pond will work in a landscape is a great, uh, uh, great tool to, to see if it'll work. So it's a lot of things to consider, not, not just a, oh, I'm going to go and dig a pond. It's <laughs> a lot of different factors. 
Definitely. I'm going to get a highlight to the, the local soil water conservation districts. And like I said, every county in the, the, the state has a local soil water conservation district. And a lot of these districts have professional uh, technicians on the, in their offices or even engineers that will help a producer kind of walk through some of the, 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 the requirements of a pond or if a pond's feasible. And of course, they work with us at NRCS. So if they don't know, they're going to come to us as an agency and, and ask us for assistance on it. So a lot of tools out there for landowners to, to go to and to get help. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, you know, you don't, if you're a landowner listening to this, you know, you don't have to do it alone. There are lots of resources and people you can talk to. Um, I think that uh, that tool you spoke about in assessing the, the soils that you have on your on a property, you know, these are useful if you have a property and you're looking to build a pond. It might help you identify where to build a pond um, or whether or not you should even build a pond. Maybe if you're looking to buy new property, you can look at, you know, the soils map for that to see, well, it has a pond on it, but is this pond just going to be a real pain to manage? Um, and then maybe you've got a pond on your property and you're experiencing some problems with low water levels or other things and maybe assessing some of these soil maps can actually help you um, diagnose some of these issues. So Exactly. And they've made it so simple on this web soil survey that uh, and they've, they've broken it down to what type of pond do you have? Is it an embankment pond or is it a dugout pond? So it really makes it. And it, once you do get into this tool, you'll probably be on it for hours on end just looking at the landscape on your property, not only from a pond standpoint, but from a can I build a sanitary sewer over here? Can I build a barn? I mean, it's a it's a very useful uh, tool, uh, all soil based. So I used it this summer to try to figure out why my garden is consistently failing. Um, turns out I don't have the proper soil over there, so I'm going to figure out something for next year. But you can use it for everything. And it is super user friendly. Definitely. So what's I haven't actually used it. Maybe that maybe I should to help my failing <laughs> garden. <laughs> um, but uh, so what scale is the tool at? Like it sounds like it's pretty fine scale if you can make some of these sort of decisions on on your individual property. Exactly. So it, it's nationwide based. Uh, you have it's it's like a. a, 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 a it's map based, I guess, is what I'll mm -hmm. say it is. So you zoom in down all the way down to to your landscape or to your farm uh, or to your house even, and it'll give you it'll give you the recommendations on that very very small scale. And it's all like I said, it's soil based. And if you look at it, and if you've seen a soil mass, which you have, they're not all straight. The soils are uh, they 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 kind of blend with the landscape. So. Uh, Sometimes you might just have one soil type on your on your uh, on your property, but uh, most of, most of the time you have multiple soils. But it, it's it's yeah, it can come down to that very fine scale. Okay, and so um, you know, thinking back now to someone who might want to build a pond, um, they've used this soils map, they they've identified an area on their property that might be good candidate to build a pond. Mm -hmm. um, what are sort of the next steps that they should do if, you know, before they, you know, get the heavy machinery in, um, you know, what are some of the other things they should think about? Definitely. Something that's very important and cannot be overlooked is permitting. And it's, uh, and I know I'm the bad person in the room, unfortunately, when I have to, to, to recommend permitting, but uh, early coordination is very important. Uh, within Indiana, we have the Indiana State uh, Department of Natural Resources, the Division of Water, uh, regulates kind of the water quantity, so the volume or the flow of the water, and they kind of have some hard numbers. A uh, hundred acre foot of impoundment is, or impoundment is what they recommend, what they regulate. So that's about uh, 3,000 or 326,000 gallons uh, of water or 43,260 cubic feet. So it's a lot of water. And an acre foot is, uh, think of it as uh, one foot and a hundred acres, I guess, is a way to think of it. It's a volume recommend or number. Another thing that they regulate at the, the DNR is the one square mile drainage area. It's also 640 acres. So if you have a drainage area that is of that or greater, they're going to be needing to look at your project. Uh, also, a 20 foot high uh, fill uh, is something that they really are interested in at the DNR is if you're planting a, a, a pond dam that is 20 foot or higher, they're going to be needing uh, to, to permit that facility. And lastly is the high hazard dam. If there's uh, structures, if there's uh, stuff downstream of your dam that if a result of a failure of your dam were to cause uh, extensive 
property damage or even loss of life that they really want to be a, a having that as a permitted facility. So that's the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. The next one is the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. They also they have the 401 water quality certification permit and the Rule 5 permit. So they are really concerned about the water quality that's in your in your pond project. And lastly is the Army Corps of Engineers is another uh, entity. Uh, Indiana has done something really good for our landowners. They have put together this Indiana Waterways Inquiry Request Portal. Uh, this is a great tool. If you can just uh, search that in a search engine, it will provide all the permitting assistance that you need between all of these regulators. So I really give kudos to Indiana and the regulators on coming together and creating that portal so a producer can come into it easily explain their project and then see if they even need to get a permit on that project. So that's permitting. The next, uh, so not to, 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 to belabor it, is uh, underground utilities are very important. Uh, you might look out of your, across your landscape and be like, oh, there's nothing out there, but it's very important to call Indiana 811 before you dig. Is is just, uh, uh, it can be very costly if you were to hit an underground fiber optic line and, and cause lack of service. That's very expensive to, to, to fix. Uh, and then lastly is it's very dangerous because if you were to hit an underground uh, gas line, uh, then it's very uh, deadly. So very important to get 811. So those are two of the very, uh, very important things you do prior to the construction of that pond. And, and most importantly, or I guess in, in addition to that, is uh, hiring, a, hiring a professional, uh, hiring a professional contractor to do that construction for you. Uh, it's really good to get references from those contractors on what they have built before so that hopefully you get a, a, a good project in the end. And, and, and lastly is to kind of see what kind of cost you're getting into. You don't want to start construction and then decide, oh, I can't afford this. So it's very important to talk with the contractor on those. That was going to be one of my questions. So I know that um, Indiana 811 is a free service, but just just going mm -hmm. through the inquiry process, is there a cost to do that? Or is it just like once you get your permit, there's a cost for the permit, et cetera, et cetera? Exactly. Yeah. So the uh, the inquiry request, there is no uh, cost at all. And I like I, I always encourage is early coordination is don't pay anything from a permitting side until you know you have to have that permit. Uh, the, what it will cost you though is if you have to get a permit through Indiana Department of Natural Resources, is it's about two hundred dollars for their permit. Uh, Indiana IDEM or, or the U.S. Army Corps don't have any uh, fees on their permits. And same with 811, there is no fees on getting that uh, locates. And you can do that as a private uh, landowner too. You don't have to have a contractor do those requests for underground locates awesome. yeah and i think um you know that that sounds like a great service that that indiana has put together f as sort of like a one-stop shop to try and find some information about this uh, for those listeners who are outside of indiana um you know definitely check with your uh, your nrcs um officers in your in your state um and they can help point you to the there may be uh, there, there is Will definitely be some some similar permitting in other states. There may be some of these some of these portals that can help you pull them together. But if not, your your NRCS um, office there will definitely be able to point you in the right direction. That's correct. Yep. And, and we'll provide links to uh, to all of these resources in our show notes. So um, and so um, so from a um, you know say so you've done you know you've you've gone through these checks and balances and you're ready to start construction. Is there um, is there a does the NRCS offer assistance during the construction phase, or is that more landowners working with their contractor to sort of to you know to design the pond, you know, and implement that um, that design? Definitely, yeah, we, we do. I guess uh, a lot of our, our goals in NRCS is is based on the farm bill uh, and implementing that farm bill. So if we don't have a financial in incentive, I guess with the, with the farm bill project, uh, it's usually lower on our priorities, but uh, uh, and depending on workloads within the areas within Indiana and across the nation, there is a potential we could assist with construction and even design on some of these projects. So it really depends on workload and requirements on that. But I want to go in, in, into that a little bit further on the farm bill end and, and talk about our financial assistance program is we have an EQIP, which is another acronym. It's Environmental Quality Incentive Program. This is a farm bill based program uh, that offers uh, payments to landowners to implement conservation. And one of those is, of course, is the pond, which is uh, is excellent. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately for some producers within within an RCS uh, is is currently we're only offering uh, assistance in ponds for livestock producers who need a watering source uh, for their uh, grazing systems so uh, there is assistance through us another a place to look for assistance from a financial end is looking at your local soil water conservation districts some of those 
counties offer offer mini grants, uh, and they, or they also might know of any other local funding opportunities that they have. Uh, and then lastly is the Indiana, Indiana Department of Natural Resources, the Lake and River Enhancement Program, also has funding for studies, engineering designs, construction, and even management of invasive aquatic vegetation. So lots of uh, funding potential out there for uh, pond projects. And like I said, uh, us at NRCS are always here to offer the technical assistance too, so you can always come to one of our offices and request assistance. Yeah, and I, I guess at the at the very least, it sounds like you know talking to your uh, your NRCS office will help identify some of these these tools and some of these uh, agencies and and people that you need to speak to that maybe you know maybe you didn't even know about some of these assistance programs and that can help you know offset the the cost of of that construction. Definitely. Pond species profile: the segment where we will showcase the biology and ecology of popular and not so popular pond species. In this episode, we will profile the red ear sunfish. Red ear sunfish are closely related to bluegill and look very similar. They can be distinguished from bluegill by a bright red edge on their opercular flap, also called ear flap, and a distinct lack of vertical dark bars along their body. Red ear sunfish grow slower than bluegill, often reaching maturity in two to three years. However, they do grow larger than bluegill, reaching up to 15 inches and 3 pounds. Red ear sunfish have a similar diet to bluegill, eating zooplankton, insects, and macroinvertebrates. They also eat a lot of snails, which has led to their alternative name, shell cracker. Because of this characteristic, red ear sunfish can reduce fish parasites in ponds, as these parasites often use snails as an intermediate host. They also serve as an important food for predators such as largemouth bass. Red ear sunfish do well in ponds that also have bluegill and provide a nice variety of fishing opportunities for anglers. So uh, I just I wanted to switch switch gears a little bit now. You know that's some great information about if you're planning a new pond construction, um, but a lot of people um, have ponds already on their property. They might have you know they may have uh, purchased a property or inherited a property with a pond already on it. They may have built one you know years ago or, or whatever. Um, and you know I get a lot of emails, and I'm sure you get a lot of um, contacts about this as well about you know some issues that that people have with their ponds from a from a uh, engineering or water retention standpoint, uh, and also um, just some ideas on maintaining those ponds from a safety standpoint and from a you know physical characteristic standpoint. So, so I wanted to focus um, the I guess the rest of this episode on, on getting some some tips from you on on pond maintenance and maybe discussing some of these common issues that people have and, and maybe ways that they can rectify those. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, number one question is should people um, put effort into into pond maintenance? Oh, definitely, definitely. So the most important is building a, a high quality dam and high high quality pond. And the secondly, and the almost I would say most importantly, is doing the correct operation and maintenance in that pond. Is is keeping vegetation established in and around that. Not I guess not really in and around, but around the pond and in the on the embankment. Uh, woody growth on the embankment or the dam is very unfortunate for a pond uh, from a maintenance standpoint because. Uh, allowing a tree to grow on that dam, uh, uh, first of all, it, it jeopardizes the stability of that dam from the fact that instead of having soil there, you have roots now. If you were to cut that tree, those roots would, uh, would would disappear, and then you'd have little places for water to seep out of the dam. So that could affect your water levels and, of course, the stability of that dam itself. So maintaining the vegetation and controlling the woody growth around the uh, the, the, the dam is very important the outlet works of that pond so the pipes or the the where the water flows around the, the pond uh, is maintaining the keeping debris and, and and stuff out of that do not build a woodshed where the water flows through that spillway uh, during high rainfall events you can't have any uh, something slowing the water down from uh, leaving the site uh, burying animals is another one the O&M that that really is highly recommended is keep keep an eye out for those uh, those little little guys on the dam portion of the of the bankment. Uh, erosion, of course, with all ponds, we always are dealing with erosion. 
and you kind of look at where where does this come from and really a lot of it comes from the wind unfortunately as it blows across that surface it it picks up the water a little bit and creates a fetch and then the longer the pond in the direction of the wind the more fetch you're going to get and the more erosion you're going to get in that in that pond so controlling that erosion the the biggest way to control it is vegetation is one the, the highest recommended way is to do it with vegetation uh, if you can't get vegetation established in those areas uh, the next uh, measure would be a, some sort of turf, turf reinforcement mat. So something that will keep the roots of that grass in place and not allow it to wash away. And if that doesn't work, the last recommendation is riprap. And riprap works, but it's just not, it's kind of the last on the list of things that I'd like to recommend for, for controlling erosion in that pond. And then the, the, to top it off with all the O&M is inspection. Inspection is very, very, very important on your, on your pond. Uh, and then if you don't mind, Mitch, I'm going to dive into a little bit of the of the in inspection on some of the things to look for. So you're doing your O&M and things are going good for your pond. But one thing you need to do in the O&M is inspect it annually. So once a year, you need to go across the whole entire landscape of that pond and uh, keep a report, keep a document, and, and keep that document updated year after year after year uh, to document the findings that you have. And things that, that I recommend that you really look at is uh, the top of fill. Is there cracks? Is there is there lack of vegetation? And this is on the dam embankment itself. Uh, side slopes of that, is, it, is, there, is there vegetation established good? Is there wetness? Is there, again, is there cracks? Is there burrow? Is there bulges, depressions, other animal burrows, uh, where the dam goes into the, the landscape, we call those abutment contacts, is there seepage, is there is there cracks, is there slips in that, uh, the outlet work, so the pipes or the, where the water flows around the dam, how's the condition of that, is there erosion through it, uh, is water actually utilizing it, is there going somewhere else, uh, the emergency spillway, so when the water, if you have one of these on your dam, these are usually uh, lower than the top of the dam, so they're a place during excessive rainfall events, the water kind of will go around the side of your dam. Is that area vegetated? Is it obstructed? Is, is there erosion in it? And then lastly, the area to inspect is the area below the dam. And really you're looking at, has there been down, downstream development that there used to not be a house downstream and now there is. And if your dam were to fail, there could be some issues for that landowner, unfortunately. Are there boils and seeps? Are there some areas that are wet now that weren't wet? Uh, are there obstructions downstream or slides? So document this stuff in that inspection report. This not, not that you have to do something today, but you can document that you've seen something. So you come back next year and you say, oh, well, that wet spot is now a trickle. Oh, that should give you some uh, some uh, uh, highlights that there's something going on there. Dams don't, unfortunately, or fortunately, dams don't fail overnight, which is great because we do we don't want those to happen but if you can document things that are occurring in that dam or in that pond itself you can really uh, take control of it uh, before it becomes a lot worse so the, some of those are some of the things i guess mitch that are really important for once you have that dam is that inspection is very important is there a specific time of year is like spring or summer or fall a better time to do the assessment uh, but really, whenever you can get out there, I would say. I don't. I wouldn't say there's a is a bad time. I'd say make sure, just make sure to do it at least once a year, because uh, 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 from a vegetative, you're going to see that there's vegetation established throughout the year. The seeps are going to be occurring throughout the year, unfortunately. Some of the burrowing animals you're not going to see as much, uh, but you'll see their 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 locations and where they're living. So yeah, but it's yeah year round. Are there um, guides or checklists that the NRCS has that can help landowners complete these these assessments and inspections? There are, there are. There is a really good guide, and uh, actually, if you check out check out the Purdue Extension website on pond management, that uh, inspection guide is there from NRCS. It's very detailed. Uh, some of our uh, smaller dams don't need to be as detailed, but it at least gives that producer an idea of things to look for when they are uh, uh, looking at their their pond. So kudos, thank you for putting that on your website. <laughs> Absolutely, thanks for thanks for having such a great document together for people to use. You know, if you think about, you know, I'm just thinking from the standpoint of if I'm listening to to this episode and I have a pond and I haven't really thought about this much before, and you know, I'm listening to all the things that you talk about, it can it can be overwhelming, yeah. and and having a place to start and and a checklist that you can work through, you know, I think that that makes it much more accessible for a lot of people to do this. And yes. and I think, you know, these annual inspections are, are important, very important from a safety standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. But also, you know, if you're interested in, in the fish in your pond and, and using your pond for recreation or other things, 
you know, low water levels is not are not going to be good for that. And so um, you may be experiencing low water level issues that are being caused by something happening with your dam. And doing these inspections um, can help you identify and, and rectify some of those issues before you get a pond that's 70% down and, and the fish are starting to die and things like that. So, yes. Yeah, and you kind of make a highlight, kind of kind of go off topic a little bit about safety, though, uh, is is all around ponds. Ponds are very dangerous if if you allow folks to to who don't know how to swim and to swim and swim in them. So having signage, especially now, when if you look across our landscape and some of our ponds are freezing up, if you're not familiar with this landscape and don't know a pond is there, and you start walking across this landscape and it's really thin ice, very dangerous. So having that proper signage is one thing that's very important from a safety perspective. Same with rescue stations, uh, having a life ring or a rope or a pole or something on that near that pond to provide, uh, if someone were to fall in, that you could save them is one thing that's very important from a safety standpoint. And then lastly is the dry hydrants. Uh, these are uh, hydrants where fire departments could come up and suck water out. Or what we've been looking across the nation with uh, trying to be resilient with this climate is provide a, a source for us to suck water out for our own use from a life Livestock from a home use too, so it's a excellent tool. But safety is very important around ponds, and we gotta highlight that definitely. Even uh, not only from those signage in the rescue station, but also if we could build a pond that's more safe, like having the side slopes to where you can mow them without having risk of overtopping into the pond, is uh, some of the some of the design aspects, some quickly design aspects. So. so say someone has a pond and they don't have some of these features that you've mentioned. Can they contact NRCS to help establish those, or how do they go about improving their pond? Yeah, that's yeah. Unfortunately, that's I wish we were could help with with that portion of the pond. It's really just recommendations uh, that we have from the safety perspective. Uh, I don't know, Mitch, if you have an idea of where where a landowner could go to get more assistance. I know the local fire departments uh, might be a, a resource uh, about ponds because they do a lot of training around ponds uh, and, and rescuing. So they might have some more additional details on how can you make your pond more safe to keep people from drowning in them possibly yeah i think that's a good point you um there may be you may consider if there's a local uh, pond consultancy you might be able to reach out to them to see if they've if maybe they've identified some places you can you can get signage or or um you know um life rings or anything like that um that would be another another thing to think about and or maybe even just you know if you if you contact your local Purdue Extension office they might be able to put you in contact with other pond owners that have gone down this road already so but you know I think a lot of people um, you know a lot of people have fond memories of, of hanging out around a pond as a kid or you know a lot of people have you know they might put a pond in they want to have their grandkids come and fish and swim or whatever and I think considering you know thinking about some of these safety aspects are really important you know you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, put in a pool without taking some some yeah. safety measures are around that pool and so i think you, if you think about a pond as a pool you know particularly if you've got children coming around using it or you get your neighbors coming down the street to fish in your pond i think thinking about that safety aspect is really important definitely and so um i, I want to um talk a little bit about some of the common issues that you see with ponds um that you you know that pond owners come to you with or that you've you know over over your many years of experience you've encountered you know i get um, emails all the time about people having issues uh, with their ponds and not not so much from a fish or, or um, ecology standpoint but more about you know my ponds leaking or my pond doesn't have an doesn't get enough water in it and so just sort of if you, you could maybe uh, outline some of these common questions you get and maybe some ways that that people can can look to fix some of those things Definitely, and there's uh, there's a uh, whole suite of issues, unfortunately, that folks come in and ask uh, ask us. We always direct them back to you, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, one of, one of the biggest nightmares, or at least a lot that we see at NRCS, is uh, uh, from a permitting side, is a landowner will build a pond and then have an excellent site and it looks wonderful, and then their neighbor will will whistle blow or someone will whistle blow on them and, and see, hey, you didn't get your permits for that, and they come to us to assist with it. And unfortunately, being a federal agency we can't go against the state agency and say hey this is good for the landscape this is good for conservation so uh, that's one of the big nightmares is, is is the folks don't do 
their homework on the permittings, unfortunately. And uh, it, it, it's frustrating when you uh, like the definition that that's always been tossed around for the waters of the United States that the folks regulate on or the regulatory folks regulate on is a bed and bank. So uh, if you look in our landscape, even in an agricultural field, you see a goalie and that, if that goalie's left unattended, you'll become and you'll have a bed and bank within that. So that could be considered regulatory channel. So it's unfortunate, but just keep in mind the permitting is very important when we get a ponds. But uh, that, if they could just do their their, their diligence on and, and, and doing the homework beforehand on the permits. Another one is a, a complaint about why is, why is water always flowing around my pond? Uh, uh, typically, this comes in when it's not adequately designed. When you have a large watershed and a very small pond footprint, uh, is water will actively go through that pond quite, uh, quite excessively. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but there is ways to fix that with bigger structures, bigger con water control structures to allow that water to be drawn down and, and go through the, the pond. Uh, ponds that don't hold water like you alluded to, that is a common occurrence. Uh, I was thinking actually before this this podcast recording is there uh, of a site that we kind of bounced our head against because we had no idea why it would not hold water uh, down in Brown County, which you're familiar with that landscape. Uh, you got a lot, of, a lot of shell rock and a lot of rocks in, the, in in their valleys. We did a core trench, great soils. The core trenches where the dam was going to be just to check the soils in that area. And the soils were excellent for holding water within that embankment. Uh, and keeping it in the pond. So we built the pond thinking, wonderful, it held water for one year. The next year it dried up and we had no idea. We walked to the next valley over and then we looked around and we saw water coming through a little crack in the, in the, in the, in the landscape. And water was actually going through the hill and it was not through our embankment. Our embankment was solid, but it was water uh, in the pool area that was exiting the, the, the pond. So that was unfortunate. Uh, to, to remediate that, it would have been very costly with midnight uh, to, to try to try to find where that fissure was at. Unfortunately, the, the landowner uh, side decided to find a new location for that pond. So that's something uh, the soil survey did tell us it wasn't a good place for ponds, but they decided to go that way anyways. Uh, overtopping is another thing. Uh, and that's usually due to lack of maintenance or bad pond design uh, is you really need a safe place for that water to go around the ponds so that they don't cause erosion. Uh, but yeah, there, there were some of the, the, the big ones is, is just, uh, I don't want I don't want to highlight all the bad, but there is good mm -hmm. stuff for ponds. Is uh, is with all these high intensity rainfall events that we've been having, it seems lately. Uh, if the pond is properly designed, you'll see that pool level raise up really high in that pond, and it might even go through the uh, around the embankment, but then it'll come back down. And a properly designed pond won't fail. So it's a uh, uh, luckily we're designing our ponds to handle those larger rainfall events, so at least at NRCS. So th that is the, the good thing, is these ponds are very resilient uh, to, to these high water flows. But once again, maintenance if you and, and inspections, if you see that the water is continually going around during these high fall, rainfall events, you might want to think about increasing the height of that embankment or doing something to keep that pond uh, from being uh, washed out. <laughs> okay, and so... Um... You know, if you're a landowner that has a, a pond, maybe it's a dugout pond, maybe it's an embankment pond, and, and you're really struggling with, with water levels, um, you know, you described that example of, of, of some issues upstream, but, but say you have, say your pond was built on a, on a site where the soils allow, you know, a lot of seepage through, or are, are there things that a pond owner can do apart from relocating the pond to try and help their pond retain more water? Yeah, and it, there's unfortunately no easy, uh, cost-effective way of doing that, unfortunately. Uh, bentonite is one of the, the clay dispersants that we recommend uh, for a soil lining. So we, you mix this bentonite with the soil that's there. This is after draining the pond down and incorporating that bentonite into the soils, and it will create that barrier to keep that water from infiltrating in those high infiltrated soils. Another one is a geomembrane or some geo... Uh, a plastic liner, I guess, is maybe the best way to put it, that uh, that you have to prevent the water from leaking out. Both of those measures are very expensive, so you'd have to weigh the cost benefit on if you were to move the pond to the cost of actually implementing those uh, those techniques. So there is ways to do it, though, but uh, yeah, it's unfortunately sometimes uh, cost ineffective. I wonder what that what impact that plastic liner is going to have on the ecosystem inside of the pond too is it going to 
not allow for vegetation to to grow through and how that's just going to change things like definitely you definitely raise a good point there uh, the, the thing with the, the 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 liner is you can also put soils on top of this liner so you could uh, put the liner down and then put two foot or a foot of soil so that you do have that ecology aspects where you can get some vegetation growth and some more normal pond habitat within that's those good. so there there's kind of ways around that it's interesting to think about the you know pond construction and, and pond ecology really in the face of of how uh the climate is changing right you said you know we're getting these these increased um rainfall events we're also getting we've seen um locally here there's been some pretty dry events too you know i have some friends with some ponds this summer they got really low the lowest that they'd seen them in in 10 years and so Thinking about that from a pond design standpoint, if you're thinking of building a new pond, may, allowing your pond to be resilient to some of these new fluctuations that we may not have seen 20 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. and, but then also if you have a pond that's, you know, struggling a little bit with water levels, maybe there are some things that you can do, you know, like you said, increasing the, the height of that embankment a little bit and, and yeah, to, to, to allow for some of these environmental fluctuations. Definitely. You know, one of the best ponds I've been on was a spring fed pond. It, just having that clean source of water really was an excellent pond and it still is today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So great. So if you, maybe if your neighbor has a nice spring, then you can do some, some engineering <laughs> to bring that over to your pond. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, great. Well, um, You've really provided some great information on on, uh, on pond construction, pond maintenance, some of the issues that, that landowners face with ponds. And also, I think you've provided a lot of information about the assistance that, that is available for people uh, looking to, to build a pond or, or, uh, or just um, assess and, and inspect their ponds. Um, one thing we like to do um, here on this podcast is ask our guests for particular recommendations they might have um, from a, uh, you know, so... Just from a general pond or ecology standpoint, you know, um, you've you've provided a lot of great, um, you know, information and, and uh, sources that people can go to for for technical guidance. But but what about you know? Do you have any books or or uh, you know, uh, podcasts or videos that, that you could recommend that people if to um, you know check out if they're interested in in uh, pond issues? Yeah, being being an engineer, I've got to kind of shield myself because I, my books probably aren't like the general public's uh, favorite type of books. But uh, but at NRCS we have a pond planning uh, guidebook that is an excellent reference that I always reference when I when I uh, uh, talk to landowners, even pre preparing for this podcast. Just reread that that book. Uh, it's NRCS publication that's just really good on 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 ponds uh, from a construction and maintenance standpoint. Uh, other than that, Mitch, not not really. You know, I uh, I could tell you the best book on energy conservation right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, one one other, I guess, not really a, a book related is just getting to know some of the uh, the landowners that do have ponds and, and stuff that they've done with those ponds has been something I've found in my that been very uh, fun following back up those land landowners that they've had and how what kind of uh, success they've had on their ponds, but that's not really a book or a guide, but, uh, having that contact with those individuals is something that I found useful. So, but I think that's some great advice. You know, it's from, um, uh, from talking to you today and what you've just reiterated, then it sounds like, you know, from a construction and maintenance standpoint, it's really important to get to know, um, the, the local people in your County that can help you with that. And, and I think too, you know, not just from a construction standpoint, but from pond management as a whole, you know, it could be really valuable trying to make some connections with other people in your area that have gone down this road already. Like maybe you can talk to some, some of your neighbors or some other landowners that have, that have built ponds or have, you know, managed fish or, or, you know, done various things to their pond that you can learn from. And I think uh, from, you know, all sorts of things that we do, we try and uh, tap into a community. And I think, um, you know, I th reaching out to your local county, um, contacts can can uh, they can help connect you with maybe other landowners that have that have had some successes or maybe some encountered some similar issues that you're facing. Definitely, don't do it alone. That's for sure, Mitch. To, there is a network out there of folks that will definitely uh, be interested. But just keep in mind, some people want to fish on your pond, <laughs> <laughs> so be careful. Yeah, you might have to. You know, if you uh, if you've got a great bass population in your pond, you might need to barter some, you know some fishing rights to get some some information on pond pond maintenance. 
Exactly. I always love the producers that want to want you to come farm all or fish all of the bluegill out of their la- or their lake or their pond that they can you can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's great. So, um, well, Scott, I just want to thank you for uh, for uh, coming on our uh, our podcast today. You've um, provided a wealth of information, um, and uh, and hopefully we've been able to answer some questions that pond owners have. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add, or um, before uh, before you leave? No, other than come to us at NRCS, not only for your pond needs, but also for any other conservation or uh, any other resilience. If you want to make your farm more resilient to these climate conditions, come to our offices and we'll help you try to be more resilient. The NRCS is a great resource, so so please check them out for all of your uh, conservation needs. Thank you. I'm always amazed at the technical assistance that's available mm-hmm. for people if they're, you know, willing to reach out and get it. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I hadn't thought about. Oh, you have you have your body of water. There's more pieces to it than just maintaining the body of water and the the vegetation and the fish that are living in there and the macro invertebrates and, and all those different pieces. That was so informative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think as aquatic ecologists and fish people, we get <laughs> we get our blinders on yeah. and we just think about the water and the fish, right mm-hmm. but without without the physical components of that pond the water or the fish wouldn't exist yeah couldn't i couldn't imagine having a leaky pond and not know where the water is going you know that's gotta suck <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants a leaky pond yeah and i think too that um you know scott made a great point about you know, dams and ponds don't fail overnight, which is mm-hmm. which is good from a safety standpoint. But I think it reiterates the importance of inspection and, and maintenance. You know, you can um, pick up some of these some of these issues early, and you can maybe f- um, you know fix them and prevent them from becoming a, a bigger issue. Yeah, I mean, and that's we take our cars to be maintained what at least twice a year, sometimes twice a year. Um, why aren't we doing that with more things and and just you have you spent a lot of money in like in this pond investment just a simple walk around will make sure that it's it'll have a little bit more longevity absolutely yeah you you've either spent a lot of money to build it and fill it full of fish and everything or you're planning to spend mm-hmm. a lot of money to do that and so i think um you know if you haven't thought about some of these uh, physical characteristics and some of this technical assistance that's available for construction and maintenance and i think it's a it's a great opportunity to reach out to the NRCS and and get some assistance with that and and you know who knows maybe you can even get some financial assistance yeah. if um, you know to help help with some of this stuff. If you like this episode, make sure you like it wherever you're listening to it. Um, rate it so that people that also like similar podcasts will be able to find it. Um, and make sure you subscribe to. Natural Resources University Network. We are a part of a larger network of natural resource podcasts, and you can find out more about fire and habitat and deer. Yeah, once you've had your fill with the most important topic, that of ponds, <laughs> that of pond. you can check out some of these other, <laughs> these other sort of less important topics. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I want to just reiterate too, you know, please contact us with with uh, questions and ideas. This. This podcast episode came about because of um, somebody contacted me about questions mm-hmm. about their pond leaking. And so that's really what we want to try and do with this podcast. If you have questions or, or ideas for future topics, please reach out to us um, and we'll, we'll find somebody who can come and talk to us about those, those topics. Yep. And check the show notes. All the good information that, that Scott mentioned is going to be located in the show notes. Great. Well... Uh, we're recording this just before the holidays. I'm not sure when it'll actually be released. So if it gets released before the holidays, happy, happy holidays. holidays. If it gets re- <laughs> if it gets released after the holidays, then I hope you had a happy holidays. Yeah, you enjoyed your break. Yeah, and uh, and here's to uh, 2021. Yay. So um, thanks again, everybody, and we'll uh, see you all for the next episode. Bye. Cheerio. Pond University is hosted by Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Pond University is part of the podcast network Natural Resources University, which is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Pond University, then check out the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University podcast network. 
Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions. Natural Resources University is funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. New episodes are released every Tuesday. For more information, follow us on our social media platforms at nr underscore university. Thank you.